Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, I am so excited. And I think you, dear listener, are going to be so excited to hear about not just the business acumen, the passive income ideas, but the essence of the wisdom of zenpiano.com, my guest, Jason Campbell. So if you're not familiar with Jason Campbell and his music, uh, I'm going to give you the rundown of his illustrious bio. Jason has released over 100 albums. He's been number one on multiple Billboard and Amazon charts. He has five Billboard top five albums in a five-month period. Uh, he's a seventh degree black belt and the co-founder of Zell Wellness. Jason's music is being used in hospital ERs, yoga studios, wellness centers, therapist waiting rooms, hospices to relieve stress on families and reduce end-of-life drug use. He's the director of music for Genius X Virtual Reality. He writes music and meditations for virtual reality. His work has also found on performance based apps like Happy, Chilly Sleep, and Focus at Will, which I use and recommend for all of you who are ADD. <laughs> Jason runs the Zen Business Mastery Entrepreneurial Mastermind and is releasing the first breathwork course in virtual reality in 2022. And we're going to talk all about this. His most recent endeavor includes purchasing the town of Cleeter, Arizona, with a small group of visionary investors. He is the sheriff of Cleeter, and he's combining Western culture with Eastern wisdom to create a community committed to the uplifting of the human spirit. Jason Campbell, how are you, brother? <laughs> hey, it's so good to talk to you here. We've had so many conversations, and now we get to record them. We have, we've had a lot of conversations. We're in Genius Network together, run by Joe, Joe Polish, and it is the most pretentious name of a mastermind group, but... <laughs> That being said, there is a genius uh, for sure with lots of those members, but especially you, Jason. And so let's just rewind the tape. And how does someone start in creating music to, let's just say, increase the vibrational mm -hmm. frequency and awareness of others? Hmm. Okay. That's a pretty big, big question. So, well, let's, um, let me, let me start with the story. So this is going back uh, almost 43 years ago. I was eight years old and my first piano lesson, my teacher said to me, never, ever listen to notes. Idiots listen to notes. Masters listen to the space in between the notes. Because when you listen to a note, your mind is cluttered and you hear nothing. When you listen to the space, the, you know, the silence, the gap in between, then your mind becomes clear and you hear everything. So my earliest entry point into music was actually meditation. Now, I didn't know this was meditation. I didn't learn, figure out that it was meditating until years later when I was formally trained in meditation, but we would just take a note, hit the note on the piano, gong, and we listen to that note dissolve into nothingness. And then there's that moment where it's a thing and it's a no thing. It's a vibration and it's a no vibration. And you focus your attention right on that spot and listen to it going into nothing. And I didn't know this at the time, but that's actually a one form of meditation. Because if we go back to basics and we say, okay, what is meditation in its simplest, most basic form? All we're doing is creating a gap in the incessant stream of thinking. The voice in the head, the blah, 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 the conversation in the head that you, the listener, is having right now with yourself, <laughs> you're interjecting in your head in our conversation here, and it's going blah, 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 blah. Well, that's okay. That's the, you know, the thinking mind we can call sometimes called the monkey mind. And we obviously need that. We have to be able to think. But the mastery of meditation is, can you turn that off? Can you have an off switch 
to the voice in the head. And in the beginning, it's actually sometimes hard. And especially as an entrepreneur, Ooh, it's, I think it's doubly hard for entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs have a lot of thoughts. It's the average person has 50,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And 99% of them are the same thoughts we had yesterday. I don't know how many an entrepreneur is going to have. Maybe they're, more. They're probably going to have double. <laughs> that's right. Because they're going to have double the amount of problems. <laughs> that's right. That's because that's what the, the entrepreneur has. It's a different profile. It's a different brain type. Um, and so when you can turn it off it's a very powerful process because if you think about it most thoughts are repeated thoughts so you don't need them sometimes you still have the same thoughts from childhood or high school or something that just keeps looping like a skipped record that doesn't serve you so the mastery in meditation at its simplest form is just an off switch click you turn it off because you have the thought and then you have the observer and really that can be found in the word that we all know called human being. There's the human part that constantly changes. We're all different now than we were in childhood. But the being part, the observer, the eternal I am is the same. That doesn't change. And so when you can activate that and connect with that to just watch your thoughts as they go by, like watching clouds or one analogy I like to use, it's like a cat staring at a mouse hole and you just stare and you wait and you wait for the mouse to come out kind of like a, a the mouse is the thought and you just wait and at first yeah, there might be a lot of mice coming out but if you can get to the point where just even a split second there's nothing there's that crack that gap in the stream of thinking well once you experience it once you can't unring that bell and that opens you up to a different level of creativity that you just can't access when your head is full. I, I love that for so many reasons. And I don't know if you know this about me, but I've been a, a long-term meditator and I started with, I want to say headspace. And I've, I've yeah. now I've used, I use the waking up app and Sam Harris. And, and uh, I love that the Zobchen idea of look for the one who's looking. Yeah. And when you look for the one who's looking, there's nothing to find. That's right. And so there's just this silent witness, this, this, this being. And so I try to explain this to my kids and they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, no, I'm the one thinking the thoughts. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll look for that person thinking the thoughts. Where is it? Is it behind your eyes? Is it behind your head? Is it in your body? Like, where is it? And they don't understand. <laughs> and, but I think the way that you described it is a really great way to describe that this idea of awareness and this idea of mindfulness and the escaping the, the prison of, of our thoughts, if you yeah. and sleepwalking through our days lost in thought. And yeah. so there's uh that, that great uh, Zen story. I, I forgot who, who tells it. I think it's Eckhart Tolle. And the Zen master is in the market and he's trying to pick out a piece of meat. And he says, which is the best piece of the meat? And the butcher says, all my meats are the best <laughs> piece of meat. And then at that point, it becomes enlightened. And you realize <laughs> all the moments are the best moments. And so it's it's interesting that your teacher taught you this amazing skill at such a young age because I thought that there was going to be, you know, this story of Jason Campbell going through the university of suffering and through the <laughs> suffering he's going to come out. And now that I've healed myself, I want to go and heal the world, but it, it didn't turn out that way for you. That being said, you get you go deeper into to music you go deeper into uh, zen and meditation and that leads you into a prof becoming a professional musician so tell us that story if you sure will. well let me also say oh there's plenty of suffering along the way so as uh siddhartha the first buddha used to say where there's no suffering there's no enlightenment because if everything is enlightened, nothing is enlightened. It's a kind of, it's a funny thing. It's it, one of the principles we teach is you know, emotional mastery. And when you get into emotional mastery, well, the first thing, if 
someone says, oh, I just want to be happy. Well, if you're happy all the time, you're never happy. If everything's blue, nothing is blue. So in order to experience happiness, you need its opposite. You need some contrast, whatever word we want to use for the opposite of happiness. And then the second part is, as opposed to, I am angry, it's, I have anger type energy running through me. Ah, because once you say I'm angry or I'm pissed off or I'm worried or something like that, well, no, you're not angry. You're a little dollop of consciousness hanging out in this big bag of flesh, meat, bones, levers, pulleys, and a circuit board <laughs> called a body. <laughs> you're not angry. Oh, you might have that type of energy running through you right now. You might feel anger. Sure, of course, that's very real. But when you learn to make a little separation between you and the emotion, first of all, you can experience it more and you can experience experience that emotion and that's okay because anger you know, emotions hang out in different type parts of the body like anger tends to hang out in the liver and the gallbladder and grief tends to hang out in the lungs and worry tends to hang out in the stomach and spleen um just to, to name a, a few of them and so when you think of emotions as like flow through and running through you it creates that little gap of space between you and the emotion and then you can regulate your emotions. It's so much easier as opposed to identifying with the emotion. So yes, is there trauma? Of course there's, there, there's trauma. Is there suffering? Yes, of course there's suffering. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Siddhartha. He used to say, or was purported to say I wasn't there. And if I was, I don't remember. He would say, suffering is absolutely 100% necessary until you realize it's no longer necessary. <laughs> <laughs> okay so you so you have gone through the university of, of suffering oh, of course yes <laughs> i think it's a universal thing the university of suffering well if you, you think about it just even, even being born being born is a traumatic experience see when we enter this life i, I like to make the metaphor we're, we're met with the sword and the flute and the flute is the breath Okay, so we take a breath. The sword, if you think about it, is the cutting. And we're met, we get the umbilical cord cut. And if we say, okay, what's the opposite of death? Well, I'll tell you what the opposite of death is not. Life. Because life has no opposite. The opposite of death is birth. Because it goes birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. And birth and death is yin and yang. So you can have that in the symbol. Life, there's no opposite to life. So you can think of life as underneath the cycle of birth, death, birth, death. And so the cutting of the umbilical cord is simultaneously a birth and a death. It's a death of the mom had this body part called a baby and that's being removed. So there's a removal, there's a death, there's a, there's a, a almost a grieving and it's in um, Eastern medicine, we call that metal element. And if, if, if we have time, I can explain that a little more later, or maybe it may be another time. Sure. But there's the, there's the cutting and then, but that death creates a birth. And then the birth is, is what's necessary. You think about it like lightning strikes a tree Well, there's a death, but then within that, there's this massive birth that happens. And that can happen in life phases as well. You have a death and it doesn't mean a literal death. It can be a metaphorical death or a death of a dream, a death of a project, a death of a season, a death of an idea, a death of a business, whatever it is, you can experience that. But with that death creates room for growth. So we have birth, death, birth, death, and then life underneath has no opposite. And you can think of life as the silence and that's the stillness. And because later on in my musical studies, I, you know, I said to the teacher, but wait a minute, how do you listen to space and listen to silence when there's a lot of notes going on? When there's no silence in here, you know, there's all types of notes and this is really full, whatever the music is. How do you listen? And she said, oh, God, you're so stupid. Why, why do you ask me such stupid questions? So this is how I was trained. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, find the silence underneath. It's like, ah, oh, okay. It me, hit me like a lightning bolt at the time because th that would be an analogy of you have a painting, but you have the canvas. So see the canvas and not just the colors. And if we can think, if you have in terms of matter, see, we have space and we have matter, like no thing or a thing. The word exist is just Latin. It means to stand out, 
to stand out from what? From nothing or no thing. And so there's much more emptiness or space than there is matter. And if you go quantum, you know, let's look under all matter with a super high powered microscope, you'll see that actually it looks solid, but we're really not solid. We're more emptiness in more space than matter. And it gets really freaky. And then we flash in and out of existence at the speed of light. But it's an optical illusion that we can't see it with our, with our eyes in the same way that 24 frames per second looks like somebody's running. It was, you know, the trick the hundred years ago or so, a little more than a hundred years ago, the filmmakers figured that out that, wow, if I run train, uh, you know, film 24 frames per second, the eye is going to perceive it as motion, but it's not motion. And with the same thing, we flash in and out of existence at the speed of light. So there's more emptiness or space than form. And so listening to silence is kind of like seeing the space. Like, don't look at the object, but see everything around or the emptiness around the object. And at the end of the day, what does that do? It stops your thinking. There's many ways to stop your thinking. I'll give you another story. When I was a, a, a teenager, I said to my martial art instructor, I said, what is Zen? He looked at me, smiled, sidekicked me hard. <laughs> he kicked me so hard. I can still feel it now. You know, I went flying across the dojo, hit the room, fell down in a daze. He smiled and walked off, said nothing. So he let me experience Zen in that moment. I think I had a word for it called Ugh! as I was going across the dojo, because in that moment when he hit me or kicked me, there was no past. There was no future. There was only now. So he put me in the moment. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you and I go to this uh, center in uh, in Tempe, Arizona, and, and an arcade called Optimize. And it's good to know that you're a seventh degree back black belt because there were some points in time I thought, oh, I could take Jason. <laughs> because it's just, and if, if you meet Jason, it's just, yeah, it's a very peaceful presence. There's uh, just a, a, an underlying calm about him. And, but when we go into a 32 or 37 degree or 43 degree cold plunge, there is no past, there is no future. Yeah. Yeah. Your mind just stops and yep. your body is shocked. And I love that feeling for that minute or two and doing that. And so there is so much wisdom in all that you're saying, but I want to address the person who's listening to this and maybe not getting it or they're type A and they're thinking mm -hmm. to themselves, well, you know, easy for you guys to say, Yeah, but I've got stress. I've got bills to pay. I've got things to do. I can't sit in a cave all day right. and just watch my breath and, <laughs> and, and listen, you know, and listen to Zen piano music. Yeah. I got to get stuff done. Yeah. And how can I get things done and yet keep the joy in just the doing? How can I strive and, and have goals and achieve goals and yet not suffer? Well, that's such a great question. And the first answer is, how do you do that? Very masterfully. Okay. So. <laughs> Very masterfully. And how do you achieve mastery? That's right. Okay. Let's, let's dig in a little bit here. So here's the, the first thing. It, a lot of times as an entrepreneur, meditation can be very difficult. I, when I train groups and I go into rooms, I remember I was in Denver and I trained a couple hundred doctors in a room. I said, yeah, I asked the question, how many of you have tried meditation and feel like you failed? Half the room goes up. And, and especially with entrepreneurs, I tried it and then I'm sitting, okay, with this meditative thing and you, you get an app, you get a whatever. And then you're, you get still and then your mind starts going, oh, wait a minute, I got this email to return. Oh, I got this to do. I got this. Oh my God, I'm wasting so much time. I could be doing other things. What the hell am I doing here? I'm wasting my time. And it almost, if you're not careful, can create more anxiety by not getting something done when you feel like you need to get something done. So, okay. And if that's you, well, what I suggest is don't start with the sitting meditation. You, you, it's, you don't have the muscle yet to sit and because the muscle is turning that voice in the head off. And if you're sitting down and that voice is actually getting louder and more stressed out, well, don't do that. Let's do something else. Now, 
I could sidekick you across the room. That's one way to put you in the now. Uh, or, or you could jump in, you know, 39 degrees water and just right. sit for five minutes. That's That'll put you in the now. And that's a very powerful form of meditation. But there's three types of meditation. There's sitting, standing, and moving. So it's not just the sitting and moving in, in a cave or the monk on top of the mountain and that looks so peaceful, but it's like, no, wait, I don't want to do that. I'm in the world. I got kids. I got responsibilities. I got, I got, I got land deals to, that, that are going on. I'm buying dirt. I'm selling dirt. I'm moving dirt. I'm financing dirt. What the hell is this sitting and being still? I can't, I can't do any of that. The only thing you want to be able to do is back to turning your mind off, but, but also, I mean, Hey, you got to take care of the body. We can, we can get to that in a moment. And here's what I have found, especially with entrepreneurs is the best entry point is through the breath and it's through the breath work. And uh, I mean, I teach Monday through Thursday. I do breath mastery for entrepreneurs, uh, 7 AM Arizona time. And we get in and you breathe and we breathe together and it's, does a bunch of things. One, it'll stop your mind. Uh, two, you don't have to think. <laughs> you just have to, you have to follow along. And then we also, it, there, through the breath, you can purge negative junk, negative emotions. Uh, and then you can also build up energy. I call it filling up your energetic bank account because most entrepreneurs overspend, not just in the checkbook, but in the energetic book as well. You have X amount of energy and you spend that energy plus a little bit more. So then the question becomes, are you over, truly overspending or are you under depositing? I take the approach that you're under depositing because you can't tell an under entrepreneur to do less. It's impossible. Oh yeah, just do less. Just just chill out. Do less. they might nod and yeah, I'll get right on that. You're not going right. to do it. So build up more energy, and the lowest hanging fruit of doing that is going to be through the breath. The other thing it will do, depending on the breathing technique that you do, it is very meditative. But it, the meditation sneaks in. It, it kind of backdoors you with the meditation, and it um, gets you to stop thinking and stop your mind through the breath. So that's not the front end. It winds up being the back end. So that's the lowest hanging fruit. Other options are just go for a walk in nature, put down your phone, stop all the phone nonsense and go walk around. Because what happens, only mankind can make a straight line. Nothing in nature is a straight line. So when everything around you is straight, it's one of the hard things about living in a city. Internally, you become more turbid and crazy. I mean, crazy is maybe a, over an exaggeration, but it can happen. But just think turbidity. When everything sure. around you is chaotic, like nature, like walking through nature, there's no straight lines. Everything's all over the place. Internally, you become more straight and more centered. If you look at the sages never went to you know, the 36th floor of the uh, tower to go find God. They always went to the top of a mountain to find God. And, you know, and why is that? Is that because God doesn't exist on a tower and only exists on a mountain? No. Looking for God is like a fish looking for water. When you look for it, you'll never find it. Right, right. <laughs> you can. Looking for God is futile. You'll never find God if you look. No, it's actually, it's already here. It's around you everywhere. But what the mountain does is it prepares you it gets you ready. It, first of all, it cleans out all the junk in your body, just climbing up and it gets your mind ready. It gets everything ready so that you can actually listen and hear. That's why you go to the top of the mountain, not because God exists there any more than anywhere else, but you get ready to do it and you can hear it a little bit more and a little bit clearer. I, yeah, I, I have so many thoughts about that and just for you, personally i know that you have your your breath work and you have your meditation but you're accomplishing so much and i just would love to know your routine so that you can take care of mm -hmm. yourself let's just use that metaphor you yeah. put your oxygen yeah. mask on first and yeah. then you go cool. out in the world and you create and you provide value yeah. so could you just share with us uh a routine that you use? Yeah, sure. And, and here's the first thing. It starts with the mindset because people will say, oh, wow, you're so busy. You do so many different things. I say, oh, no, no, I'm not busy. Bees and beavers are busy. 
I'm never busy. I'm just present. And maybe if you look at my schedule someday, especially recently, my goodness, if you look at my, my schedule, uh, there's a lot on the schedule. So we could say you have a full schedule. Okay. That can be a fact. However, it's always now. And the, whatever it is, half a dozen things I was involved in before this podcast, before we met at noon. And then I have a, a schedule of a bunch of different things later on. And I have dinner. I have all types of things that are scheduled. Okay. I have all those things, but that's not now. Now is right now. So right now we're doing what we're doing, completely immersed and completely focused. And so even the thought, oh, I'm so busy, that creates this loop. It almost creates an energetic drain and it starts to suck out your energy because that's not a, a positive thing. Uh, that, that's like a turbid, crazy thing. So first thing I would drop busy and replace it with now. The other thing in a little, I'll answer this question, but a little, little tangent is um, drop all mindfulness. Mindfulness is wrong. Say what? I thought that was your whole thing, mindfulness. I thought that's what you were teaching. No, the whole mindfulness industry is completely wrong. I used to think that it was designed by like an evil priest who wanted to trick everyone into not being in the now and put mindfulness. But no, I think it was an innocent mistake. Uh, uh, 1910, because I, I researched this, there was a scholar named T.W. Davis translated the word sati, which is Sanskrit, into mindfulness. Because think about it. Do you, do you really need your mind to be more full? Oh, yeah. No. Gonna, no, it's the opposite. You need mind emptiness. That's correct. Mindfulness is wrong. Mind emptiness is correct. But I think it was an innocent mistake. And he's a Buddhist scholar in 1910. I'm grateful the guy to, for, for translating. So he just used the word mindfulness. Probably a better translation would be um, awareness to the word sati. Sanskrit's tough to translate. Sometimes one word, you need a paragraph <laughs> to translate it. So it's, it's, it's very hard to do. And so then, oh, let's be more mindful. Or the worst thing is let's work on being more mindful. Oh, that's the opposite because presence is not something you can work on. It's only something you can experience because, oh, I'm gonna work on being present. No, it doesn't work because there's only one time you can be present now. And so it's not, it's even impossible to work on. So all you can do is come back into this moment. And, and yes, you have to plan. You have to think of the future. You have to th think we, we have to be very practical here in managing our affairs. But at the end of the day, you come back to the now and come back to the now. So, so the first part is, is just, uh, you know, it's, it's so cliche. I almost don't want to say it, but it's, it's mindset or we can say attitude or, um, just, okay, I have things scheduled, but it's right now. And I'm going to gracefully or even graciously or mind emptyingly, not mindfully, go through the day and just be present right now. Okay. Then the question becomes how, how do you do that when you have all these things pulling on you? Well, the first thing is everything that's pulling on you is actually your best friend because you say, oh, I want to be centered. Or you look at someone, oh, that person's so centered. Well, you think about it. What creates the center? Being pulled off center. If you're never pulled off center, there is no center. It doesn't exist. So everything trying to pull off at you actually makes you. So any obstacle and things pulling you off, you judo flip and you think, oh, wow, you're my best friend. You're trying to pull me off center right now. Wow, this is awesome. This creates my center. And the other thing that is so important is that you have to sharpen your blade every day. Don't be the lumberjack that says, oh, no, I don't have time to sharpen my blade. I'm too busy cutting down trees. Well, that's a very foolish lumberjack. And if you don't think you have time to stop and do some breath work or do something to clear your mind because you're a complete scatterbrain, busy like a bee and busy like a beaver, well, then good luck. It, it, it's very hard to, you know, go through with some presence and go through grace because then there's going to be little space between action and reaction. And that's the key, the space. When you get space in your head, then there can be space between action and reaction. And okay, this is going to sound funny. I, I, I'm going to say it. I was always thinking of not saying it because I don't want to overwhelm anyone, but I suggest over 50, four hours a day of wellness. That's tough. Four hours. But let me, let me justify that. doesn't mean four hours in a gym, hitting it hard. I don't do that. 
No, it includes walking the dog. It includes a little bit of stretching. It includes getting a massage. It includes going to optimize for an hour and sitting in a whole bath and doing a compression. And, and you can do other things. I walk the dog usually twice a day. Most of the time I actually do phone calls because it's really convenient for me. What am I going to do? Sit at my desk and do phone calls? No, I'm going to get outside and I'm going to walk. And I have a, a, a little mountain uh, right outside my house. I can walk out my house and I walk up there. I, I, I know on it where I have reception for the phone and I know where I don't. So if I'm on the phone talking and having a phone call, okay, and, I, and I'll do that for at least an hour a day. Uh, and so it's just built into it. So it's not a chore. Oh my God, this is something I have to do. Now, if you're not doing anything right now, start with five minutes. And actually, here's something with me. Oh, I don't meditate. Oh, I can't meditate. Oh, I don't have my time to meditate. Well, you're listening to this. Just do this right now. Okay. So the, I'm talking to you, the listener. Close your eyes. Breathe in. Breathe out. <sighs> Open your eyes. You just did your meditation for the day. Congratulations. Okay. That you can do. And there's an old Zen saying or Zen, you know, the master says to the student, you know, meditate for 20 minutes a day. Oh, I don't have 20 minutes and med meditate for 10 minutes. I don't have 10 minutes. Meditate for five minutes. I don't have five minutes. Well, if you don't have five minutes, you need to meditate for two hours. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah it, it's true. And I, I want to talk about getting into that that habit. I do want to hear about more about your your actual daily routine. Mm -hmm. So I'll just share what mine is right now. And uh, I say this with some shame because it used to be I would wake up and I would do your Cincinnati Reds breath work. Ah, yes. And that was seven minutes. And I want to ask why I don't or why you think I don't do it because it's seven minutes and I always felt better. Yeah doing it and somehow i just lost yeah. the habit of it yeah so now i've got this new habit i'm doing at least 100 push-ups i'm first thing i do when i wake up as i meditate and with the making the waking up at about 30 minutes that's great just a, gu a guided yeah, meditation that's great then i do my push-ups uh then i take a walk and then i connect i i want to connect with family uh you know my loved ones i if, if uh, you know, my, my son's at college, I, I want to connect. And so I'll text them or calls or, or whatever it is. And then I feel like I'll start my day. And yet the breath work yeah. is right there. <laughs> Anyways, that's what I'm doing. I want to know what you're doing. And I want to know why I quit doing something that felt so good. Oh, it happens all the time. You just, you fall off the wagon, you just lose the habit and one day turns into two days. The first thing I would suggest if you're already meditating and that's a great morning routine, by the way, I w would you say that that's one of the reasons that you're so successful is because of that routine or similar morning routines? I mean, I think we can get into the definition of success. That's right. That's a whole other, but, you know, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but I would say that if, if I define success as having a calm mind, a fit body, a house full of love, then I think those are, are definitely habits that yeah. help with, with being successful yeah. or, you know, being, let's say a good ancestor. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great routine. The first thing I would just suggest, if you're doing 30 minutes of meditation, just start with seven minutes of breathing and I'll bet the other 23 minutes of meditation will be even better after you do the breathing. Perfect. Same amount of time. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk uh, about the uncomfortable piece of the breathing mm -hmm. where you've got four levels. And when I did the fourth level, my mind starts freaking out. I can't yeah. get that. I can't hold that breath. Yeah. And for those of you who are listening to this, you're like, what is he talking about? Can you kind of explain <laughs> sure. the breath work? Sure. It, um, uh, okay. So there's uh, so many different levels of, of the breath work. What you're referring to, these are getting more into the intermediate and then also advanced. And some of them are super advanced when you're pumping your body full of oxygen and full of life. And then you exhale and you hold the exhalation, emptying your body of oxygen. Now the technical word for this is called intermittent hypoxia. When I learned this in the eighties, it was called do this. 
most of the things I learned in the very beginning were just called do this. All the names change and everything, but well, these are old, old concepts. And it does a few magical, magical things holding the out breath. And if you can try it and well, try for five seconds and then 10 seconds, I mean, ultimately you build up to three minutes when you can hold the out breath for three minutes, you have a, a an immune system of steel because it builds up your immune system uh, because you drop your blood oxygen level and then you pop it back up, then you drop it down and pop it back up. All types of studies on this, uh, on that. But here's the other really, really good thing that it does. And this is what you're referring to is that it activates the lizard brain and the lizard brain starts talking to you saying, what the hell are you doing to me? Oh my God, I'm going to die. And sometimes it gets loud and it starts screaming and yelling at you and that's okay. We need the lizard brain. The lizard brain is your best friend, but you don't always have to listen to the lizard brains. Sometimes the lizard brain can give you good advice, fight or flight. Sometimes, no, not so much because you're, you're, you're going to make it. And so you wind up building your nervous system and just building your power of intention by being very still when you have this screaming lizard brain and you say, okay, lizard brain, you can yell and I, I, I love you and you can say whatever you want. And I understand you, you don't even have to be quiet. You can, you can yell louder if you want to, I'm going to hold. And that cultivates, it's not just an inner peace, but the ability to stay very centered under adversity and under other things that are coming at you. Because, hey, li life can be a shit show. And sometimes the shit show starts from within. Sometimes it starts from without. <laughs> sometimes external things happen. Sometimes it's internal things happen. And that's the part of it, though. We need we we need adversity you need things to pull you off center so that you can be centered and that's one of the powerful powerful things and what i tell everybody in the training look all you can do is the best you can do and just be present and maybe you make it for the whole time that we're, we're doing in the whether it's a recording whether it's live or whatever and maybe you don't Either way is maybe one day you make it, maybe the next day you don't. That's okay. The only requirement is just be here right now. And when, not if, but when you're pulled out of the now into some thought and blah, blah, blah. And okay. It only is important how quickly you can recover because you can't like mastery is not to be found in perfection. It's to be found in presence. And then what's the quickness? Because then that, what that does is build the muscle for the speed from upset to reset. You get pulled off and then come right back. You know, you get upset and then it takes you three days to reset. Okay, well, we got to build the muscle then. And that's okay. And let's see if we can turn it into two days, the next one, then one day. And then, you know, one minute or five seconds. So you get pulled off and then uh, ah, take a deep breath and then you're okay. And so that's a muscle that you build and holding that and doing that type of breathing is so powerful with that. I love that. Okay. So what is the Jason Campbell four hour routine towards, <laughs> towards mastery? Okay. Well, here's the full disclosure. I don't do that every day. I set that as my benchmark, uh, you know, most days, I don't know, in, in, in a week, let me think about this. Do, do I make it? And I'm not rigid. I'm, I'm very flexible with this, but there's a bunch of days in a week that I don't do four hours. Uh, occasionally I need a day to like do nothing and just like lay on the floor <laughs> maybe, or just <laughs> watch a show. Although I haven't been doing a lot of that lately, but occasionally, occasionally there can be nothing days. So, so this is okay. I, I don't like to be rigid. I may like to make it fun and light and happy, but usually it's, I mean, I teach breathing for an hour and I do, I do everything when I teach. So I'm doing it as well. And I do it with everyone. So I have that hours like built into my day. Well, I probably have an hour built into my day of just walking and usually it's walking the dog, but I don't walk the dog. The dog walks me is what right. I do. So usually that's morning and night. And so I have two of those four hours. It's just built into routines that I don't have to think about it. And then the other days I might be doing some yoga. I might be doing some uh, more Qigong. I might be doing, and I usually start in the morning before I even teach. Like, even what, what is Qigong? Oh, Qigong is just energy work. Think uh, like uh, standing yoga where you're, okay. you're moving energy. It's actually really, really powerful. It's uh, kind of like Tai Chi. You can think okay. of it 
but it's it's the movement and the circulation of chi which is energy and it's a powerful way to store up energy it, it, what i said earlier your energetic bank account is so you you build up that currency uh, then you go spend it. <laughs> so what you do that you build it up so you don't get depleted. Because when you get depleted, your immune system drops. And then when your immune system drops, it's easy to have unwanted guests come in and set up shop. So we want to keep a strong immune system and we don't want to be depleted with energy. I think anybody who's lived any amount of time has experienced at some point you feel completely depleted of energy. Uh, it happens. It's, I mean, it's happened to me many times that's happened, but then the question is how quickly, how quickly can you recover? Uh, I'll go to the gym a couple days a week and I'll do, uh, you know, I'll lift weights. Uh, it depends on the week, but usually I'm doing cold baths at optimize a couple times. I'll try and get a massage in once a week. Uh, that counts <laughs> doing it just sure. wellness and just, or maybe even I haven't been doing this lately, but taking a 15 minute nap in the day, like, like that can count towards your wellness. Um, I always suggest, uh, I don't, if you're not doing four hours, don't start with four hours, but do something that you can succeed. And the best way to do it is to, I call uh, forced cultivation, meaning it's scheduled and you don't have a choice. You just don't have a choice. It's just what you do. I mean, my dog looks at me with these big cute eyes and everything. I don't have a choice. What am I, I, I can't say no to this. She's too cute. And so I go take her for a walk and she knows, and she knows the time and she'll come up and I, I know what she wants. And um, so put yourself in a situation where there's no choice in the matter. You just go do it and it's part of your day. And so it's very habitual. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I remember listening to Sam Harris talking about his meditation practice. And he said, I would meditate for years. And it wasn't until I went on retreat, I realized I was just thinking with my eyes closed. <laughs> and uh, can you elaborate? Yeah. What does he mean by that? Because I personally have never been on a silent meditation retreat or any type of extensive, say, 10, seven day, five day retreat with someone like you where that is say eight hours a day of just yeah. working on on well mind emptiness let's yeah say. And, and probably what he's re re referring to is, and i'm just going to guess here uh is he didn't shut his mind off he didn't have the ability to turn the mind off and to completely drop in without thinking so thinking with your eyes closed which is okay that's not time wasted to thinking with your eyes closed um, because, hey, I'll have somebody come, oh, you know, I did a great meditation or, oh, that was a bad meditation. You know, I had, I was, my mind was busy and that meditation was bad. I said, no, 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 stop it. There's no such thing as good or bad Zen. There's only Zen. And if you're just still, and if, if your mind is busy that day, okay, well, your mind is busy, but the awareness of watching it and watching a busy mind, you're still building the muscle. Now, in this case, sure, you can go and do complete immersions and just immerse yourself and no phone and no nothing. And are you going to be deeper? Yes, of course, you're gonna drop in in a certain way, especially if you're in a good space, you know, a good environment, maybe somewhere out in nature. It's going to be a lot easier than sitting at your desk with your texts going off and your, you know, kids asking you questions in the other room or like with all the things that are pulling at you. Ultimately, the muscle is to be able to do it while things are pulling at you, unless you want to leave society. And that's OK. I, I, I believe it was Gandhi was once asked by a reporter, Gandhi, if you're so spiritual, how come you don't go to the mountains to find God? And he said, well, if I believe God was only to be found in the mountains, I'd move there immediately. <laughs> <laughs> because, hey, in one way, if you think about it, it's much easier to drop out of society. I mean, back and we could go back and forth on this, but go with me on this point and to, oh, I just want to be so still and I just want to, you know, be so Zen and be so peaceful without things pulling on you. Well, that's actually easier. You know, try running a family, try running a business, you know, or raising, raising a family. How about a relationship? How about all these things pulling on you? And when you can be still and be centered in that, it's a much stronger muscle than not. So, so, it, so it has to do with building a, a muscle. And here's the other thing. Look, 
you have, don't worry about being at one with the universe. You have death and all of eternity to be at one with the universe. Enjoy your separateness. We're all separate right now. You know, you have, you, you, you get issued a body. Cause what I was talking about earlier. Okay. I was taught this as a child. This is not my shirt. It's the shirt I wear. It's not my car. It's the car I drive. It's not my house. It's the house I live in. <laughs> it's not my land. <laughs> it's the land I run businesses through or however, however, however you want to want to think about it. And so now I'm not talking legal viewpoint. Yes, sure. I own the shirt. I own the car. I own the land, blah, blah, blah. Fine. Right. From spiritual viewpoint. You don't own anything because at some point you part ways and at some point you give it back and you can even take that a step further and say, it's not my body. It's the body I live in because at some point you give it back. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, I mean, we're gonna lose everyone and everything. Everything is on yeah. lease. Yeah. And so there's this attachment that people have, and you see it, the drama unfold all day long where their identity or ego is wrapped up in this yeah. story of let's go back to success because I'd love to know your definition of success? Ooh, it's a real good question. So when, when I think of the definition of success, I, I, I like, I don't know if it's a complete, it's not quite a complete definition, but I like the Earl Nightingale. Uh, he said, however many decades ago, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Success think, is the worthy progress is the progression of a worthy ideal. Yeah, progressive realization. Pro progressive realization. Of a worthy ideal. Of a worthy ideal. Yeah. And, okay. and that's one way, but do you even need to progress towards a worthy ideal? Maybe. Uh, you know, maybe you do and maybe you don't, because also, see, we have different seasons of life. And at different seasons, you have different goals. And, and, and what we teach is, is we divide your life into basically five seasons. We, let's go zero to 108. Okay, we're maybe stretching at 108, but go with me on this. Sure. And we, when we use the metaphor. There's a metaphor of, of life called the five elements. And we say wood, fire, earth, metal, water. Not literal wood, literal fire. It's a metaphor for the repeating pattern of five. Because if you look around, things tend to work in fives. Look at your fingertips, your toes, the five musical tones. Uh, and, and so even the all of oriental medicine is based on five, dividing the body into five different components. And so we say wood, but it's not literal wood. It's not, it's not literal, uh, literal fire. So if we look at your life in your life seasons, well, let's say wood, fire, earth, metal, water, which is springtime, early summer, late summer, fall, and winter. And springtime or wood element is age zero to eight because that's the sprouting and that's everything grows. You know, it's a two-year-old, you see a two-year-old the next day and they look different. Like everything just sprouts and there's so much movement. But once you hit eight, you go eight to 33. I know it's a 25 year cycle and I call it, that's early summer and that's look at me what I'm going to be. And that's when you come into your power and that's when you do. And if you're going to do like physical training, that's when you do the intense physical training. That's when you do all your hard martial arts. And if you're into athletics and sports, I mean, that's when you push and tax your body and you do all crazy stuff with the body because you have to push it and, and like forge the sword. But then you hit 33 to 58, that's earth element, that's late summer. And see, wood energy and fire energy sprout up. They go up automatically. Earth energy is flat. So a lot of your life work actually comes between 33 and 58. A lot of times, I mean, it's, and again, these are not exact numbers. These are seasons. So give or take a year or two or three or five, or, you know, these are, and everyone's a little different. So this is real, real flyover. Um, but that's when you really come into your power. And that's when you do a lot of your entrepreneurial work is done at that age. A lot of times that might be when you raise a family. Uh, you have to be careful not to blow your body out with all the things that are pulling on you in that phase. And then the next one is the fall, 58 to 83. We call that metal element. And if you think about it, that's when things start to fall in your late 50s. Your organs fall, your face falls, people start to fall, people start to die, I mean, or, or, or around you. That's your, your, it's a harvest. And you really reap what you sow. So it's a really, really good idea to have some physical vitality um, moving into your 50s, you know, and getting, and getting that, you know, moving into that, into that time period. And then the last one is, uh, I'll be quick here, is uh, water element or winter, 83, 
to 108, and that's preparation for death and all of eternity, and try to give away everything that you have, both material stuff and also any type of wisdom you have, time to give it away. I, th- I mean, we could have just had a podcast just on those <laughs> five elements. Yeah. This, this, is, a, this is a part two. We could go really deep with that. One of my favorite books is by David Brooks, and it's a simplified version of this. It's called The Second Mountain. And the first mountain is egoic. Hmm. And it's a, it's a important first mountain, I think, for people to climb. I wouldn't say skip the first mountain. It's you know get the you know get the good education, get the good job, get the house, get the cars, go up that mountain and achieve, achieve, achieve. You get up to the top of that mountain if you're lucky, and you realize oh, it's empty. So then yeah. you go into the second mountain, yeah, and it's more purpose driven, yeah. and you put aside the egoic stuff, and it's about vocation instead of a job. Uh, your 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 highest calling. It's about yeah. intimacy and love and relationships. It's about community. It's about your faith and your spirituality. And it's a harder mountain to climb, but much more, uh, you know, just fulfilling. Yeah, that's right. But I've never heard anyone break down the five elements like that. And uh, for those who want to learn more about the five elements where where could they go and, and learn more about that uh well okay i'll give you a few resources you can go into zen piano uh and you know if you're interested in any of our programs shoot us out an email uh what we were talking about earlier i don't advertise anything there's no websites there's no landing page there's no sales pay i mean because uh, there, there's other things we do we do re- retreats we have a ranch we own a town that we didn't talk about maybe that's next time uh we oh, have, we, uh if we got time we could talk about oh, cool. i'd love to talk about <laughs> we it we can go into that but yeah. if you if you go to zen piano and if you're interested in any of this uh, we just do invite only and so you either you have to know somebody to get into any of our programs or you can just reach out and then I can have one of my assistants or someone, you know, reach out to you uh, because we just we, we don't do that type of marketing. Uh, it's all invite only and you just have to know somebody or get to know us to participate in any of our uh, programs. It's like the opposite. It's like I'm not on social media. I, I have accounts somewhere. I might look at a Facebook every once in a while. I don't even post my albums. I do a new album the fourth Friday of every month and I don't even post it anywhere any more. I don't do any of that because my business model doesn't require me to be on any social media. And if it does, it does. And if you're on social media, that's fine. But be very, very careful because it scrambles the brain. And I think you asked me earlier, you know, how do I um, manage so many projects? Uh, and, And one of the things is I'm not scrolling on Instagram. I'm just not. I don't, I don't, I don't, Put my head there. Uh, I like YouTube for education because I, I learn. If I want to learn something, YouTube is actually great uh, for just for learning stuff. But the the endless scroll and the mindless scroll. Oh God, no! That's to me that's poison because that's the opposite part of the brain that does deep work and goes into you know you can be in, immersed in deep work and then you get distracted and. It takes something like 20 minutes or so to come back to having like the brain connections all connect up when you're in deep work. So like if I'm working on some music or something, no, I'm working on it. I'm not sitting here scrolling around scatterbrain. I, 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 I go into it and I go deep uh, into it. And, and so that's part of it. So whatever you're doing, do it. And, and the concept of multitasking is a myth. First of all, there's no such thing as multitasking. Multitasking really means doing a lot of short tasks, but you still can only do one thing at a time. So you do one thing, then you do another thing, and then you do another thing. And okay, sometimes you might have to do that. Your job might require it. Your business might require it at time. Maybe you have employees and you're putting out fires. I mean, whatever. But just be careful of it and at least have some time where you can go deep into whatever you need to go deep into. And it really, really is uh, 
is worth it. So to answer the question, you can go to Zen Piano. We have a breathing course. We have, I have all types of music. I mean, I'm on Spotify and iTunes. We have, I have sleep music. I have study music. I have music for pets. I do virtual reality music. We have a, a breathing course. Uh, you know, we have one, like a recorded one that some of the tracks that you listen to, we have a live one that we do. We have a master's uh, apprentice program where we meet live a couple times a year and, you know, go run up a mountain and we do stuff. So we, we have all types of uh programs that we that we do i have a, a if you have a virtual reality headset uh the, you mentioned in the bio that i have the first breathing course in virtual reality it came out uh, if you download no kidding yeah it just came out like last week so if you download the retreat app you just go into the oculus store and look for retreat uh i'm in there with a bunch of other people as well retreat is like uh master class for vr and so it's really cool. So there's some really, really cool uh, stuff in there. And you actually, you know, probably know half the people that are that are in that uh, app, Mark. So <laughs> I, I definitely do. And uh, I might even make a course on passive income for uh, oh, retreat. I'd love it if you joined. Yes, that would be great. That'd be yeah. so awesome. Have you teaching this in virtual reality. I, I, I would highly encourage it. <laughs> but I, I did get a sneak peek of Jason teaching in VR. And it is really cool. He's on a mountain, you're immersed and you're doing the breath work with yeah. Jason. It's, it's super cool. It is the future. I'm, I'm excited now because I didn't know that it came out and I have my own VR headset. So. Yeah. That's cool. Well, here, I'll tell you another project that I'm doing right now. This is one that I'm really, really excited about. And we just started this. Uh, I'm writing all the music for the Vatican NFT. So the Vatican wow. is publishing all the great Michelangelo and all their statues and the Sistine Chapel. And um, I have the, 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 the privilege, really, of, of scoring it. And so you say, hey, what, is, what are some, you know, this iconic, some of the best art of all time, the most iconic art pieces? And then the question is, what does it sound like in an F NFT? So these are things I think about all day. Like when I go to bed, that's what I go to bed thinking about. When I wake up, that's what I think about. How do you how do you match that in with a modern day? And it's, half the people will be watching it, listening on their phone, not even good speakers. And so how do you make the match the sound to these iconic art pieces? So that's a really, really fun project. And that comes out sometime uh, next year. The first NFT launch will come out. Okay, that's... We could go down a rabbit hole just on <laughs> how you even got that gig. But I want to talk, I want to go back to your definition of success. And then yeah. I want to talk about your vision for Cleeter. Mm, okay. Well, okay. So back into the definition of, of success. Well, what I, what I don't necessarily do is have a hard definition. Now, there's a lot of drills. I mean, there's a, 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 a drill and this is in Genius Network. I, I, I learned this. It's the, I know I'm successful when, and then you write down the eight things that you feel successful so you can have a marker because see, it's one thing to be successful. It's another thing to feel successful. See, I call this, it's the Indiana Jones principle because, you know, you know, somebody that's like a rock star and they do really, really well and they accomplish a lot of things and whatever it is, and they're a really good parent and they're just, they're just good. And you look at them, you're like, wow, you know, you're, you're just awesome but it doesn't mean they feel awesome. And why do I call it the Indiana Jones principle? Well, you go to the movie and you watch Indiana Jones. Wow, Indy, you're so cool. You're so awesome. He's like, really? I'm getting chased by a boulder. I got snakes, I got arrows, I got I got all this, I got planes. I got, would you think it's easy being me? Someone's trying to pull my heart out. Are you kidding me? You don't wanna be me. I'm getting terrorized actually. So, <laughs> but from audience viewpoint, you think, oh, wow, you're so cool. I wanna be you. From his viewpoint, really? You don't wanna be me. It actually kind of sucks. <laughs> right, right. And Elon Musk, I think recently, <laughs> said no one would want to be me it's so true that is so true what that man goes through is unbelievable you, you know yeah i don't want to be elon musk good god so yeah. but it's easy to look uh from the outside and maybe i'm talking back to back to the listener maybe you're that maybe you have some of that it's like wow you're so cool and you're so awesome it's like yeah but i don't feel cool and so that's okay though it, there's a difference. See, being awesome and feeling awesome are two separate things. And actually, they're even two separate skill sets. And if you feel awesome all the time, you don't feel awesome. You have to feel horrible sometimes, or horrible is maybe an exaggeration, but you have to feel the opposite of it. It's okay to not feel good. Just don't stay there. And I, I will, I'll, I'll take it a step further. It's not that it's okay. 
it's necessary in order to feel good, you have to not feel good. Otherwise, if everything's blue, nothing's blue. So, so you do need contrast. And so, I, you know, when I wake up in the morning, do I think, oh, okay, today I'm going to be successful? No. Uh, when I was younger in my 30s, did I think that probably? Uh, I, I would think more of that, a little bit more goal oriented and task oriented. And, and also as you're, as you're building a career, um, then that's important uh, to do. I, I like creating. Ultimately, I'm an artist. And what am I creating? Well, one of the things, a uh, skill set I have mastery of, I, I know how to create sound. I know how to sculpt sound. I know how to connect sound into emotion because what is sound? Well, if I take my, if I take a pencil and I wave it 20 times a second, up to 20,000 times per second, that vibrational frequency we're going to perceive as sound. But if I do it 200,000 times per second, we are going to perceive that vibrational frequency as light. So it's the, the old saying, when a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? And I remember as a kid, that was like, cracked my mind. Does it? Yes? No? I don't know. Does it? Does it? And well, actually, no, it's a simple answer. It's an obvious answer. No, it doesn't make a sound. It makes a wave. It, but it only turns into a sound when there is a person or a surrogate, a recording device of some type, to turn it into sound. And so you have vibration. And so how do you turn vibration into emotion? And then how do you take vibration and pack it into a little MP3 or WAV file and turn that into, into emotion? Uh, that is an art. I love that art. I'm obsessed with that art. That, that to me is a lot of uh, fun to do that. Because if you also think our frequency range, what we perceive as sound is very limited. And elephants here around seven, eight, uh, like beats per second and that fre frequency or Hertz. So elephants can talk and we don't hear it. Dogs hear up to 50,000. So a dog whistle. So there's sometimes a dog will hear something that we can't perceive and all there's all types of vibrations and communications going on in nature. That's outside of our perception of sound. Um, that's happening. So we have this like this little this little range. And also the ears are the first sense that develops in the womb. The ears are connected to the kidneys. Uh, back to the five elements, we call that water element. And the kidneys are the batteries in the body. Think two Duracells in the back in your back. <laughs> those are those are your energy. That's what's that's where we store uh, energy in there. And so the first sounds that we hear is mom's heartbeat. Gunk, 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 gunk. Gung gung. So it's actually, there's a rhythm that we first start to hear. And so there's something very powerful uh, about sound. And we got two ears, we got one mouth. So uh, nature tells us that listening is more important than speaking. And if you go back thousands of years, the ancient character for medicine combined two characters and it said music and herbs. So the music, music and was, herbs. Yeah, been used as medicine since the beginning of time. Fascinating. And I took a philosophy class in college and they did bring up if a tree mm. falls in the woods <laughs> and there's no one there to hear it, <laughs> doesn't make a sound. And we actually had to write a paper on it. So I did not answer it correctly. <laughs> what was the conclusion? What did you say? Well, of course it makes a sound. <laughs> it seems obvious. <laughs> so, so your definition of success is being creative. And yeah. if you couldn't create, would you suffer? Ooh, I never thought of that. Well, I suppose there may be two, two separate things. I mean, it, it's easy to create suffering and creation at the same time. You can suffer and right. create simultaneously. They're not mutually exclusive. <laughs> right. uh, if, you know, if, if I couldn't create, would I suffer? Well, if something happened when I couldn't create, um, well, let's well, just say you couldn't create what you love to create. Yeah, I couldn't. Well, you know what? Then I'd have a choice. I would have a choice and, 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 you know, and then you can choose, okay, do, do I want to choose to suffer? Do I want to choose to be in resistance? Because a lot of times, okay, suffering is made up of three things, resistance, attachment, and judgment. And so we resist, what do we resist? We resist the now or we create a story and we resist the story because you might have this whole life story, but it's still now. And we attach what we talked about earlier, me, mine, we attach to things and okay, manage your things, entrepreneurial success and success with stuff. I mean, it's just called survival. Y you have to do that. And that's actually an important part 
of spiritual cultivation is take care of your business and take care of your world and take care of your family or, or whatever lifestyle that you have set up, take care of it and be masterful in your lifestyle. And so we have attachment, judge, uh, and then judgment. Okay, not to be concerned, confused with discernment, because we have to discern, is this a good price for the land or not? Is this going to give me the ROI that I'm looking for by investing this money? Well, that's, we have to do that discernment, and we can call it judgment. So when I say, oh, don't judge, well, no, you got to be really practical. But the monkey mind will judge nonstop. Oh, that person's better than me and I'm too tall. I'm too small. I'm too fat. I'm too thin. I'm too smart. I'm too dumb. Oh, I'm better. I'm worse. like in all that stuff that doesn't help. Like it doesn't, maybe it can inspire you to, to be better. And if you need that to, to, to be better and to, oh, wow, I really suck at this and everyone else is better than I better work harder. Okay. I've had plenty of those moments in my life, especially growing up. You know, like, wow, I suck. I better practice. Yeah. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll take that. But I think you get the point where, where judgment can be, um, not helpful or judgment can, excessive judgment can create suffering. So the question is, would, would you, you know, would I suffer? I guess the answer would be if I needed to. If you, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. That, that's a great answer. And let's let's just segue into a project that I know you're super excited about. I'm excited about it for you. The town of Cleeter. Yeah. Can you give us the backstory and what is the future vision, Sheriff yeah. of Cleeter? Okay. Well, this it started out. Oh, what would this be? Maybe a year and a half ago, I saw a, a news article for a town for sale. I'm like what? How do you buy a town? Well, well and, I, and I looked at it and also then I found out the town was about an hour north of my residence. Cleeter, Arizona, C-L-E-A-T-O-R. And you can look it up and Google it. It's a, actually a famous town. I never didn't really appreciate how famous it was until I owned it. And so I saw this advertisement and I'm like, oh wow, a town for sale. So I sent a text to Joe Polish and it was a joke. And I said, Hey, want to buy a town? And with a link to it minutes later, he texted me back. Maybe <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> what? I don't want to buy a town. What am I going to do with the, what do I know about running a town? I know nothing about what, what, what am I going to do? No, I don't want to do it. And he's like, well, no, I think it might be kind of cool. What? Ah. And, and we like circled the wagon going back and forth. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no about it. And then, um, you know, we got one of our, uh, we got another real estate, uh, guru uh, on the team and we were, you know, all meeting, meeting together and we, we, we had a meeting and he just said, okay, cause we're thinking of all these creative things we can do with the town. And he just said, look, gentlemen, yes or no. Do we acquire the asset? And he went run around the table and he's, um, well, uh, yeah, I guess so. And then everyone's a, yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay, let's just acquire the, acquire the asset. Then we'll figure out what to do with it. Okay, so we did that. Now, to answer your question, what is the vision? Well, here's the interesting thing. If I said to you, hey, we bought 40 acres in the desert, who cares? You of all people would not be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would make you an offer. What if I three cents to the dollar? And then sell it with order financing and make cash flow. That's right. Well, you you're the you're the land guru. I learned from you with dirt and land and um but however, if I say, hey, we bought a town, now all of a sudden that's more interesting. And it's it's uh, 40 acres. Uh, there's, I think, 14 houses on it. There's a bar. There's a store. There used to be a schoolhouse. If you go back, oh, 100 years, there was a railroad. There was a post office. And it was a mining claim. Mr. James P. Cleeter founded the town. And they, you know, they pulled out silver. There's still the mines uh, that are out there. And so a lot of the things, so we started to say, okay, we own a town. It was a little, I mean, the first of all, we're making this up as we go along. You can go to the website, whatsyourcleater.com. And we had a whole NFT and we did an NFT launch um, with it. I believe it's the first town that ever has had an NFT and the first town that has ever been in virtual reality. So you can go to the retreat app and see Cleater in virtual reality. So then 
we say, okay, what are some creative things we can do with a town and just being awesome? Well, well the, some of the things is, is it's important that it is an uplifting, is that it helps people, is that there's healing that goes on in the town. And, and we have uh, events, we have some art events uh, coming up in, in the town. We have all types of like fun events and between scavenger hunts and uh, different parties, you, you can do it because it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. You're, you're out in the Bradshaw Mountains, heading out to Crown King. You drive through this little town called Bumblebee. I think it's like population eight. And you go you know, a few miles down a dirt road and you're in the middle of nowhere. And then you just descend upon this old ghost town. I think there's 14 residents and there is a bar. So you can go into a saloon. So if you show up with spurs and a six shooter, you'll fit right in. And... Um, <laughs> And so we're doing we're doing all types of of, of just uh, creative projects aside from the VR and the NFT. Uh, we have some charity. We're we're looking at putting together a uh, like a charitable sheriffs association uh, that you can buy into and be a posse member, and you know we'll help different different charities uh, that we're doing. We're we're redoing some of the infrastructure. We actually forgot water first time in the town's history. We had to dig seven hundred feet down. To, uh, wow. to get water. Yep, there's one of the universities out here that we're doing a bunch of stuff in conjunction um, with and just having different types of events. Let, let's see, there's a ton of stuff that we're, um, that we're also doing. And, and part of the wellness that goes on there. Okay, so if we say, if we look at a sheriff badge and everyone knows the five points of a badge and everyone knows, okay, a sheriff is about protection of persons and property. Okay, very important. We have to protect us and we have to protect our property. However, if we get into success, we get into wellness or well-being or happiness, it doesn't end there. The sheriff is not going to protect against emotional distress. It's not going to protect against anxiety. It's not going to protect against mental turbidity. It's not going to protect against confusion. It's certainly not going to protect against germs and diseases and stress. I mean, if we could, you know, shoot those away with a six shooter or an AR or whatever, I'd be doing it immediately. But unfortunately, you can't. So, okay. So we have Western culture. We have the sheriff, but what if we did this? What if we flipped the badge over on the backside and we looked at those five points from the viewpoint of wood, fire, earth, metal, water? And it's the five elements of the repeating pattern. It's about seeing the matrix. It's about medicine and medicine of, of growth. And when I say uh, medicine, I'm really, in this context, I'm referring more to the Eastern medicine and the Eastern, even just wellness and well being. And let's have the true warrior defends on all fronts. So sure, against a bad guy coming at you, yes, of course, but it, more often in life, you're gonna have stress coming at you, more than bad guys. And if you have more bad guys than stress, you might wanna look at your lifestyle. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> so that's part of the healing, part of the wellness. And so you have a Western culture with Eastern wisdom and let's put it all together. Because, you know, it doesn't matter. Wisdom, it does not matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter. And guess what? There's an infinite amount of ways to walk up the mountain. Like circling back to the beginning of our conversation about being present and being in the now. Well, there's many ways to get there. You know, you can sit and do meditation, you can do breath work, or you can go run out in a, a, a mountain. Um, you you know, I, I, I had a conversation with a woman who flies, um, uh, used to fly military jets, you know, military planes. And we talked about that, about, oh yeah, oh, that puts you in the now. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there, there's many ways to get there and don't be attached to the skillful means of actually getting there. Just get yourself into, um, into the now. So talk more about don't be attached to the skillful means of getting there. Okay. Well, so I'll give you uh, an analogy. There's uh, let's, let's go with Zen archery. Okay. You practice Zen archery and I'm not a master archer, but I've done pl plenty of archery, but you do when, the, when you do the Zen archery, there's a, there's a focus to get your mind right and to get your mind completely present of, of, of Zen. Zen. Zen can just mean presence. So you reach that. And then there's a tradition of once you reach that point, you put down the bow. Why do you put down the bow? It's not about the bow. The bow is the tool. It's like the bow is the hammer. If you build a deck, well, 
at the end, you put down your toolkit. You, you don't have to keep your toolkits off. You're going to go enjoy the deck because <laughs> it's not right. about the tools. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so the bow and the arrow is just the skillful means to bring you to that point to Zen. Now, my personal opinion, I don't think you have to go that extreme and put down the stuff that you like. I, I still swing a sword. I, 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 I do all types of things that I enjoy that put me in the now that I could, you know, uh, maybe put down, but no, I don't want to put them down. I like them. So I don't think you have to do that, but it's a great teaching of separating. It's not about the bow. It's about the mind. Uh, we, I used to have a company years ago called Zen Marksman, and we did the same thing with firearms training. It wasn't about the firearm. It was about the mind. And the firearm was just the skillful means to, um, you know, to get your mind into that point. So it's, it's, it's such an important skill for everyone's growth is getting their mind right. Yeah. And I don't know about you. I don't watch the news. I don't, I know you don't look at social media. I don't look at social media. I'm sort of blissfully mm. unaware of what's going on in the world. I know there's a war yeah. with Russia and Ukraine. I know there is suffering. And yet day to day, I'm sort of just detached from it all. How do you reconcile the suffering where it doesn't seem like you could have much empathy in the sense that your mind is right, but you want to go and heal and help other people raise their vibration yeah. frequency. Yeah. And well, do you ever feel it's just such a big project? I'm just kind of okay. So it's it's a good question. So it, it always has to start with you, and it's very easy to oh I want to go help other people, but you don't help yourself. I think you said in the beginning, put your own uh, mask on. Oxygen mask. Yeah. Oxygen mask on, on, on an airplane, because you can only give what you have in abundance of. And you know, it's like oh I want to give away money. Oh, but I'm broke. Oh, but I want to go. Well, okay. <laughs> well, you gotta make, go make some money first, and then make enough that you can give it away. And so it always has to start on yourself and, and, and not, you can say, oh, but wait a minute, that's selfish. If I only focus on me, but I really want to focus on other people. No, it's actually selfish not to, because if you don't take care of yourself, then actually over time, you're going to become a liability to others. And so if you want to be selfless, you have to have a little bit of, I'm going to be over dramatic here, selfish about working on yourself. And so everything starts with that. And then you come to, okay, what about global suffering? What about human suffering? What about the human condition? Well, you can do what you do. And you say, okay, you know, one drop in the lake, in the pond can create a ripple. And, oh, but it's such a big pond, it's not going to make anything. That doesn't matter. You, you don't want to think like that. Just do one. One thing is enough. Even just starting with you, one thing. And if you feel compelled to go help others, and if that's just part of part of your calling in some way, okay, just go help one. And then after that, help one. And then maybe it's two at a time, maybe it's a million at a time, but it's still one. And so you just one and that's enough. And what can you do about all the wars and all the suffering? Well, chances are you can't do much. Maybe there's a few people with the power that can actually do something about it. Um, and the problem is a lot of those people that have the power to do it, they're not concerned with ending human suffering. That's, that's not on the agenda. <laughs> that's, right. Suffering is, a, is collateral damage of a different agenda. So that's been like that since the beginning of time. You can go back to some of the oldest manuscripts, the Bhavagad Gita. And there was the, and we spoke about this, I think in the hot tub, right? The, the one-eyed land king. Right, <laughs> right. Gita. And the one-eyed land king only wanted one thing, more land. And actually, I, I will admit, you know, I, I, I can kind of feel some of that because I like land too. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you have to be careful. And right. it, it, it's, look, there is enough. And it's a good thing to have, even in entrepreneurialism, have your enough number. There was a, 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 a Taoist master, one of my teachers years ago, he would always say, Jason, you don't need to put everything in your pocket. 
it's okay. I love that. Leave it where it is. It's okay. You don't need to, it's, it's what a great, what a great teaching. Uh, my, my business partner of 25 years has a saying, he likes to say, look, you don't need to mo remodel your hotel room. You don't and need to is, remodel your hotel room. Yeah, what you don't need mean? to remodel. It means, look, how long are you going to be on earth for? If you think about it, not that long. So figure out what's your enough number. What's enough? Hit yeah. your enough. Whatever your enough is, hit your enough and be clear on it. Then after the enough, it's a party. You can have more, you can do stuff, you can do whatever it is that you need to do. But there is an amount that's enough. And the clearer you are with enough, well, the better off you'll be. Yeah, I, we have a, a passive income mastermind group that defines it. Once yeah. your passive income yeah. exceeds 200% of your fixed expenses, you're, you have enough. Because yeah. even in an economic downturn, you're still fine. Yeah. And yet we're always moving the goalposts. I know mm. I have that tendency where, for example, if we have a, say, a Black Friday sale and it goes well, well, I don't know if it went well, if it didn't go well. I really don't. I mean, I guess it did compared to last year, but then if I look at another Genius Network member, there's like, oh yeah, we did 15 million last week 15 million and then you feel like oh wait i'm my business isn't enough i'm not enough so true i can be doing so yeah. much more and yet to to get back to that what you were talking about earlier i think is so just fundamentally yeah. such a great reminder that yeah you will be pulled off center but you can get back yeah, sound. well, you know, it even ties into, so when I said judge, maybe a better word is compare. You know, yeah. so comparison, if you want to be unhappy, compare. Because, oh, you think you're so cool with your business because I'm doing X. But guess what? There's someone doing 10 times you. And guess, but that guy has someone doing 10 times them. And that person has, so, so it, doesn't, it doesn't stop. And then, or you can, oh, well, I'm doing 10 times more than this other group and I'm so cool. So that's such a futile uh, thing and you have to be careful of it. And that's the monkey mind. And so, and guess what? Those, the, I, I experienced that too. So that, that's just the monkey mind. You look at something that is more than what you have and oh, wow, I really suck at this. And oh, I need to have more it's okay to have that thought and maybe it's tr there's truth to it maybe hey this is my journey and i need to do this and that's inspiration so you just have to discern what makes sense but be careful of the dark side <laughs> and the dark side is if you have one you want two if you have two you want four if you have four the, the one-eyed bland blind land king that what do i want more land uh, you know, there's a joke of, of like uh, for guitar players, like, you know, how many more guitars does a guitarist need? Oh, just one more guitar. That's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> As a musician, I understand that. <laughs> that actually makes sense. Right. To me. <laughs> but it's just, oh, just one more and just one more. So you just have you, you, like you have to own that. And when your mind runs away with it and you think, oh, you know, I, this is more than I need. And this person has it. Just laugh at yourself. Laugh at the monkey mind. And we, we like to say, chain the monkey to the tree. But we have to know that the monkey is a master locksmith. And however much you train that monkey to the tree, it's going to escape and it's going to come out and it's going to start, you know, oh, you, I, I need more. Because there, here's a, I'd be curious if you agree with this statement. This is what I have found. Most people, if you, however much you're making, if you think if I can only double my income and add a zero to my net worth, then I'll be all set. I, younger me, a hundred percent. Yeah, was into that mentality. I had scarcity mentality and it was never enough. And I think that, and I talk about this in, in my book, Dark Rich, it wasn't that there was anything out there that was going to make me happy. I just didn't internally feel like I was enough. And mm. so I kept, you know, I wanted the big house, I wanted the big cars, yeah. and I wanted to signal to other people I'm successful. And after doing all of that, I still didn't feel like yeah. I was enough. Yeah. And it's, it's, an, you know, it's no fun when you're going through it, 
But then when you get to the other side of it, it's it's profoundly yeah life changing yeah uh, to get to that point. But to your point, just like you, I still have those thoughts. Yeah, where oh wait, I I could be that, or I could be doing more. But uh, again, I don't want to be Elon Musk. I don't want to. I don't want to suffer the way that that's some right. People have to suffer. Yeah. to achieve those those things. And right, it's man. I just wish it were so much easier. It's just. Not easy. <laughs> it's just not. And it's funny because you brought it up earlier. It is two different skill sets. There is the skill set of conventional success and running a business and being an entrepreneur. And growing your passive income, but then that other s- skill set is learning to be centered, learning to be happy. Mm, yeah, you know the mastery of of equanimity, and no yeah. matter what happens in life, getting back to your center and having that peace of mind. It's the two are not. It's not once I get this amount of passive income, this amount of net worth, this object or vacation, whatever it is, then I'll be. It's you can have. It's just two different things. Well, because it's still now. It's still now. And you're still you. Yeah. And your external situation is your external situation. And at some point, you're going to give it all back. So it's still now, and you're still you. So if you're listening to this, I hope you're realizing why I wanted to talk to Jason so badly. Because if you listen, or if not listen, but if you read the Review Digest each week, I'm not in my thoughts ever talking about how to make more money. I'm not giving you any tactics of here's the best headline to use for your land marketing. I'm talking about these issues of can you build your business and simultaneously have the joy Mm -hmm. day to day, moment to moment while you're building it? Can you find the joy in the struggle? And I think this entire podcast with Jason is really showing you the path of of how to get there and why it's so important. And so, Jason, I want to just thank you so much for taking the time and spouting so much wisdom <laughs> in the art of passing conversation. This is so much fun. <laughs> it's been really fun. I I want to be mindful of uh, or. I shouldn't say mindful anymore. I, I want to be, yeah, I, I want to be uh, respectful of your of your time. So we are at that point then that I want to ask you, and your mentorship has been invaluable this podcast. But I want to ask you for one more tip of the week: mm-hmm. a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go and do, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What else have you got? Okay, well, here, here's a bunch of things. So, so if you go to zenpiano.com, uh, you can download a uh, five-minute breathing exercise. And it's a lot of the stuff that we spoke about. So, so you can do it and you can actually experience. Second thing, uh, I do a new album the fourth Friday of every month. So whenever you're listening to this, go on to Spotify, iTunes, look up Jason Campbell Zen Piano, and just click on the most recent album. Whatever the most recent is, click it. And then put on headphones. Each song is three minutes. Listen for three minutes and don't listen to the notes. Listen to the space underneath the notes and see if you have a moment of not thinking. I love it. I love it. Well, my tip of the week is going to be a little bit different than zenpiano.com. It's going to be how can we as entrepreneurs, because I truly believe if you don't pay, you don't pay attention. Yeah. And so if how can the entrepreneurs listening to this and you talked about cultivating that habit, you spend an hour with entrepreneurs going through the breathing, going through the meditation. Yeah. What an amazing way to start your day. And because I've done it with Jason, I can tell you that there the investment that you would make in that hour with Jason guiding you will be a it's like a thousand extra turn mm-hmm. yeah I, it's ineffable <laughs> the way that you will feel afterwards and taking that feeling into your day which then takes you into the rest of your life having that start in that now and builds and that builds and the compounds i can't tell you what a difference it's going to make in your life if you start off with that hour 
of building your energy, getting more present, building the the muscle, if you will, of being able to hear and see the space in between the sounds. So Jason, I know that you don't market it, but how could we get uh, involved? Go to zenpiano.com in the contact and just uh, send us an email that you're interested. Okay, fantastic. So Jason, hopefully I'll see you later at Optimize, but if yes. I don't, I look forward thank to it. you again. <laughs> Is there anything I should have asked you I didn't ask you? Well, you can say, does God have God? And maybe we'll do another podcast on that question. <laughs> <laughs> does God have a God? All right. I'm, look, we're definitely doing a part two. There, there's, so, there's so much more to talk about here. Uh, because we didn't even really get into like the, the deeper parts of Zen and your teachers and what yeah. is Zen. Yeah. Because there's so many different uh, disciplines as far as uh, awareness is concerned. Well, let's do a part two. We'll go deep. Well, or deeper. We'll go deeper. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I would love that. So uh, does God have a God is the only question <laughs> I, sh I should have asked. I didn't ask, but we don't have time. No, nope, we don't. It. <laughs> okay. We contemplate that. We'll contemplate that. Is that a Zen Cohen? Yes. Okay. And am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. Uh -huh. Cohen. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank the listeners. Hopefully you're getting a ton of value from the podcast. If you are, just do us three little favors. Follow, rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of your review to support at thelandgeek.com. I'm going to send you a signed copy of Dirt Rich. Even if you don't want a signed copy of Dirt Rich, it really helps because the only way, the only way I'm going to get the quality of guests like a Jason Campbell from zenpianomusic.com is if you do that. So it also helps you as well. Be a little selfish. <laughs> Follow, rate, review the podcast. All right. Jason, we're good? Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, one, two, three. Let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.